The Monterey Bay Poetry Consortium presents John Dotson and Peter Thabit Jones, recorded live by Zoom on September 12, 2021. Um, it is such a joy to have you join us again, uh, or many folks for the very first time here for the Monterey Bay Poetry Consortium. My name is Kent Latham. Um, I am our one of our, our MCs, one of our regular hosts, um, specifically filling in this, this month for Bob Nielsen, who is our, our kind of our standard coordinator uh, for the monthly readings. Um, we've got our, our official overseer, our guru of the entire series is, is in the room with us today, John Lowey has been helping um, guide this series for decades. And I don't mean that to talk about age, I mean that to talk about incredible experience and wisdom and guidance. Um, but it is definitely my honor to be to be part of this experience and part of this team to make this series going. Um, the Monterey Bay Poetry Consortium has been running for, I think, closer to 40 years now than, than 30. Um, it is the oldest continuously operating poetry series on the Monterey Bay uh, Monterey Peninsula, at least at least kind of the, the south end of the bay here, if not both ends, up to Santa Cruz. Um, and it is uh, it is a really remarkable series. We meet every month, 2 p.m. on Sundays, um, second second Sunday at 2 p.m. Um, so if it's your first time here today and you like what you're hearing, please please you know continue to to rejoin us um, as we move forward. We're staying on Zoom, you know, kind of for the time being, for the the indefinite future, as um, you know, as the pandemic continues to be uncertain and unsafe in crowded spaces in general and public. Um, so, you know, again, it's a wonderful opportunity to get people in from around the world, including today's one of today's readers uh, that would normally have not been able to join us, um, you know, at least for this particular day at this particular time. Um, so it's a really remarkable chance. Um, and I just I thank everybody you know in in the room in this space with us here for helping make this possible. Um, during our our more traditional brick and mortar days, we are typically hosted by Old Capital Books in downtown Monterey, Old Town Monterey. They're on Alvarado Street now in a new location, just above the Twisted Roots Smoke Shop. Um, so if you are local to the peninsula or you get to to visit uh, you know here and there, do stop in, give them a you know give them a hello buy some books, support one of the only uh, you know, remaining independent booksellers on the Monterey Peninsula, one of the very few black owned bookstores in all of California. Um, it's a really great store and we love to love to support them. And I will give a couple shout outs at the end of our session today after both readers have presented um, to a couple events coming up next month. Um, there, are, there are several poetry kind of celebration festival style events. Um, in addition to our own series that I'll, that I'll recommend for us all. But that is, that is plenty of yammering introductions for me. So I would love to introduce our readers. Um, I'll, I'll introduce each of them individually. They will then read for about 20, 25 minutes, give or take, you know, kind of it's up, you know, the, the time is free. It's, it's up for them uh, to, to grace us with as much as they're willing. But, you know, we're, we're aiming for about an hour here today together. Um, and, uh, and then at the very end, if anybody feels like lingering afterward, you know, we're, we're sorry we can't offer books to buy through Zoom here. But, um, you know, it's always still, still a chance to kind of stay on Zoom for a few minutes at the end and, uh, you know, get to chat with each other if you, if you are so inclined. So. All right. Without further ado, um, it is it is my great honor to introduce uh, our first reader today, John Dodson, one of uh, not only our, our most memorable returning readers for this series, but one of our team members as well, one of our one of our co-collaborators, co-conspirators behind the scenes. Um, John always seems to radiate more peace and harmony simply by entering a room than I think most other people can manage in a lifetime. And uh, it's, always, it's always a joy to be in his presence. He joined the Monterey Bay community with us here almost 50 years ago in 1974. Uh, he arrived planning to manage the Pilgrim's Way bookstore in Carmel. And although that plan didn't materialize, he taught at Santa Catalina School, also spent 20 years hosting a poetry program for local and traveling poets on KZU Public Radio here. John has published several books of poetry and prose, including The Enduring Voice, a journal of his experience as poet in residence at Robinson Jeffers Tour House in Carmel. If you've never been 
absolutely make that one of your first priorities. It is, it is a magical place. Uh, in 2008, John had a deep encounter with the spirit of Dylan Thomas by way of the poets Peter Thabit Jones, our other reader for this afternoon, and Arnwy Thomas, daughter of Dylan Thomas. He journeyed to Wales and wrote Love Forever Meridian, published by the Seventh Quarry Press and Cross Cultural Communications. Plays by John and Lisa Morosky were staged at the Dylan Thomas Theater in Swansea. John is currently completing the book Singing in My Chains, Hearing Dylan Thomas at the Birth of an Age. He leads the Monterey chapter of the Friends of Carl Jung and learns daily from his growing pastel of grandchildren, which is, I'm, I'm just gonna assume here is probably one of the brightest lights throughout these last year, you know, et cetera, year of pandemic. Um, just the joy of children, I'm sure has been a wonderful thing. So John, thank you for, for being here. Take it away. I just returned from greeting my fifth grandchild, uh, who is named, actually carries the name of my, uh, my father, uh, Jay. Um, I do have uh, a sharing for you today. Uh, let me first of all say that uh, it is you who make this meaningful. I'm sure Peter agrees fully with that sense. It is you being here now. Uh, this is where the meaning uh, is. I'm hearing more sirens out here. Sometimes Carmel sounds a bit like Manhattan. Um, and I was wondering, you know, now some of these siren trucks now, and, and you hear it, it feels like there's a whole cadre of sirens and you look and it's one vehicle with multiple. And I was wondering if that indeed began with 911, um, which I'm certain we are all feeling today. And the range and complexity of feelings that we have here on the 12th of September, uh, you know, the, the 12th of September, 2001 was not easy street. Uh, so it wasn't just yesterday we're commemorating, we're, we're remembering a change. Um, no, ma no matter how ordinary a day may feel, there are no ordinary days. Uh, I think that's one of the missions of, of poetry. And I see so many fellow poets, uh, here in the session, again, if I, if I started to say hello to everyone and connect, it would be the whole session. I'm glad you're all here. I'm glad you're all here. I imagined some of you being here. You said you would be. Um, and then I knew there would be surprises, and there are. My task is to connect. That's what I want to do more than anything. Uh, is to connect with uh, each of you and, and all of you by means of this strange and difficult art, I feel, uh, the art of poetry. And I see so many of you here who know this work. What I'm going to share today is a rhapsody uh, a rhapsody means a stitching together. So as I was contemplating being together with you right now, I trusted the process and let these forms uh, stitch themselves together. A rhapsody. The holy place The holy place is secret because it is so close. Jean Gibson refers to poetry as the history of the dateless. 
that, that's a good koan to think through, a history of the dateless. And I, I think you all have that experience in poems where you would say they, they may travel through all our lifetimes and timings and these timings and those timings, but in themselves, they may evoke history, but they're not limited to history. So uh, poetry is the history of the dateless. Uh, I will confess that takes on a bit of a different meaning to me now that I'm 71 years old, sister. Uh, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That was probably the first poetry I, I knew in my life. Uh, I could take you to the rooms in Northeastern Tennessee where I have very distinct and clear memories of hearing that prayer and saying that prayer. And of course, you know, it's scary. And I checked, I know that you know this poem in the British Isles also. I checked with one of our friends uh, and I see Caroline nodding. So this, this poem is not, it, it's known in the English speaking world. And I remember feeling quite frightened by it. You know, well, what, what would happen if I should die before I wake? Uh, maybe this was the start of poetry for me. I loved Humpty Dumpty. Uh, uh, which is also a tragic poem, as we all know, things end uh, in disarray with Humpty Dumpty. I enjoyed Old King Cole uh, and the Merry Old Soul. A lot of my poetry probably comes from this book too. Uh, some of you might, this was a classic hymnal in America in the mid 19, uh, in the mid 20th century. So my first poem uh, is the first poem that ever came to me. And it came in a classroom on Tennessee history at my junior high school. And again, if, if I could make this poem into a real lens, I could expand this into a whole story, but I'm, I'm already uh, going long. Uh, but we were in the class and a, a powerful southeastern storm arose and in the midst, the, the darkening of the sky and the southern Appalachians when a major storm is coming on. And in the midst of the, the teacher's presentation, this crash of thunder. And I remember today, as well as the day it happened, and I was 13 years old, uh, the windows shook. And every got, everybody got very quiet. And the poem that came to me was, The Thunder Rolls, The Strengthless Stop to Listen. There's actually a little meter there, Peter. The Thunder Rolls, The Strengthless Stop to Listen. It never occurred to me to share that poem with anyone. Uh, I just took it as something that had happened. Now, in my early 20s, I was thinking of how poetry functions. And I wrote this uh, to say, can I stop the nuclear plants? That was a big worry of mine. I have one vote. Can I rebuild the cities? Uh, I can't figure out where the garbage goes. Uh, can I stop the killing going on? Uh, can't provide bread and milk for the masses. Can't batter down prisons, solve unemployment, inflation, or even pay my own doctor bills. The polarities are just overdrawn these days. Shadows of instant apocalypse are sharper. Patterns, shadows of instant apocalypse are sharper. Neurotic chatter passes as the state of civilization. 
sinking into the eyes of my infant son, who's now in his mid forties, I cry out to the world he is born into. Above the mad endeavor to make ourselves lords of ourselves, that oldest mortal fallacy, what can I say to the inhabitants of earth? And this poem, uh, about the same time, early 20s, dateless. But I was uh, near the house where my sister and I grew up. And I've learned so much more about that location as I'm glad I've lived long enough to learn more of the deep, deep history of my, my natal ground. Beside the asbestos shingled house, Reedy Creek, though long entombed, still spills into the long tainted sacred stream of the Cherokee. Bending around the shoulder of Bay's Ridge, the Holston still draws its frontier children out of our desecration to join the pulse of April's glory. There I would crawl hand over hand along that riverside to retrieve one wild iris in purple victory. We grew up beside US Route 23, which came to be known as the Hillbilly Highway, a major uh, immigration route from the South to Northern employment. I wrote this poem under the bridge over Route 23 in my industrial town. Some research, others develop, all purchase and consume our own self-manufactured poisons, moving through life as one continuous rush hour. Some are driven for property. Some are convinced by advertising to beat the very devil for greed. Others kill themselves to escape with no idea whatever why they've made the sacrifice. What have we been delivered from? What have we delivered ourselves up to? Well, in my college years, and I have a college roommate present in our midst today, but the late 60s was a, an interesting time to be in college in Chicago. Let's just leave that there. But after that era uh, was over, the, the college years and the alliances of that period, which were very deep in the group I was fortunate to be with. And I wrote this poem in reflection, mid twenties or so. Could we have so much have underestimated the forces against us? When once we strummed each other's lyres and blended lovers' promises? Was our intent so gravely misconceived when we tried to link rainbows and pull ourselves up to the stars? To stand naked in the fire of dawn? Watching heaven and earth pass away, how could any of us have believed that the storm would cease? that mindless ravages would not continue? Could we not have foreseen the virulence of the coil that twists souls against themselves? And seeing now, what shall we go on? When the smallest lights are dying away, where can we turn? But out of near total darkness, to the nearest potential, love. Uh, this is a very, uh, a poem I've never read in public before. And I, if I tell the whole story, I've used the rest of my time. 
Uh, I grew up with a twin brother. Uh, we had different mothers and we had different fathers and our houses were across the street from each other. But we were twin brothers. We about the same age exactly. But for reasons no one knows, life got very complicated and, and my twin brother was not able to make it. Uh, he was uh, very seriously uh, emotionally uh, damaged. Now, back home in Tennessee, we have that term, I trust it's also common elsewhere, of, of company. Uh, when you have company, when, when we grew up, it, having company meant, you know, get the house cleaned up, clean yourself up, uh, company's coming. Uh, and it had a really warm sense of company, you know, having company. So this poem is called, uh, The Child for Whom No Company Came. And if I tell the story of the earliest origins here, I, I would probably just break down in tears, but conscience these days no longer compels us to justify any overt self-interest. Having exploited each available option as it arose, we have devised good and appropriate myths we can live by, and now we have all arrived. We may take this occasion to remember our friend to whom these conventions didn't quite apply. The child too frail to, to pass the minimum tests required of all the rest. The one for whom even the ordinary injuries were too hurtful, too dire for him to endure. This was no textbook case, no observation to be drawn about this boy whom the crush, just the everyday push and shove overcame. Know now that he was one who couldn't face the dark threshold that daily awaited him. Such a peculiar need for tenderness, the get ahead game plan would not tolerate. The most ordinary consolations were unavailable. The kernels of love were missing and dry husks failed to sustain. We were hardly expected to break our stride when his soul began to die. So alone was he found, choked to death after all these years of trying. At least we can set aside a moment to weep for his pale lost spirit. The child for whom no company came. Love's vow, give everything. Give the shirt off your back if need be. Doubt it not another minute to the very next hand across the table, next voice on the phone, extend yourself, search out singing purposes in every granted breath, simply pass them on for all who might receive the one worthy gift we can bring. Love's vow, in the end, to conquer all lesser things. So those were 20s and 30s in the history of the dateless. I'm going to read a different sort of poem now. Um, about 1990 or so-ish. Uh, it was, uh, my children were young. Um, uh, video games were first in homes. Uh, this was after the period when a stack of uh, 
four stacks of quarters and a trip to the pizza store were important for the, for the boys to play video games. Well, and then it was, oh my goodness, they can have them at home now. Uh, so this was a, an early day of video games, uh, still satellite television. Some of you, how good are your memories? Uh, the test is this was pre-internet. I didn't even own a modem. There was no Wi-Fi. There were no uh, PCs. But there were satellite dishes and that video games had come to the living room. And at this point in my life and in my career, it would be safe to say I was overwhelmed. We can leave it at that, depending on how much time you have. So this poem came to me as I listened to the boys and their friends. So some of the speech is actually recording the dialogue of, of uh, the boys sitting in front of the video screen. And, and then some of it is coming from elsewhere. The title of this poem is Borderline. Rev up the old cyclorometron. Get ready to remember yourself. And foresee yourself. It's getting a little edgy with this remote. Keep what you've got or press another button and whirl again. A quantum mechanic I should be, significans, significatum, doing my best to apply a little psychotopology. Give that laser disc another spin. Politics is nothing but symbols says the preacher propagandist. Behold the angelic cavalry charge, the four horsemen's greatest hits, Genesis to apocalypse, Gog and Magog, ignite and ignore, regress and restore. The evangelic phone bank lights up the parts and body shop, but wait, $50 on your card, and you can own your own Golgotha lampshade. Tweak or be tweaked is what you get. Good sweet torture is what you get. Level one, done. Keep an eye out for rogue nations, nuclear proliferations, gangster regimes, governmental ghost traps, econo, macro, micro meteoroids falling from the sky. Stay strong, baby. Passing through level two. Colorful bullets splash in both your eyes. Level three. Cloak yourself, cloak yourself. Three direct hits and your stardust, bud. Poof, your history. Want to try your luck again? Pulpits exploding, excluding, exploiting, racial projectiles, ethnic factions, assault rifles cruising, bright red cells in parking spot lots, pools of red cells on tar-splattered asphalt. I can't take this anymore. Everything is spinning too fast. Everything is coming and going all at once. Just change it to anything else. Some kind of spiritual crisis this is, some kind of psychotico-cosmic cataclysm. 
Dire zire, die zire. But there's nothing else on. For war is constant here among the inner planets. Kyrie eliason. Christe eliason. This is a poem from 1976, datelessly uh, to those of us who are blessed to live here uh, next to the Pacific Ocean in Central California. Uh, so this was a couple of years after arriving here. The poem is called Sanctuary. Many times the mind is unsilenceable, infested, but on foot, as the sun sets, in the outreach of a hand, we can share the gray-green sand, black seaweed, this briny wind. Can there be any good excuse for falling unaware of this life's mystery once? if even for an instant of solemn joy, we have entered the sanctuary of eternity. The holy place is secret because it is so close. I'm going to close with this poem in honor of Old King Cole and his merry old song. Uh, another uh, beach poem. Uh, this is River Beach at the mouth of the Rio Carmelo. Some of you know this location as passionately as I do. And all the rest of you, you know it, even if you don't know it. But it's where the Carmel River enters the Pacific Ocean. It's certainly among the most powerful places on our planet. So I was there as the river was flowing into Carmel Bay and there were so many gulls. So the title of the poem is A Thousand Gulls. I'm not closing with this poem. Well, maybe not quite so many. Uh, or maybe it was more at the mouth of the Rio today. As I watched the fresh water, deep river brown of valley drown beneath the salt water waves. Beaks aligned Upstream, untoward the estuary, a gaggle of gulls were swept swiftly backward by the current unto the breakers where just before doom they lifted off one by one and then all together swerving up and over the waves in a great arc then to return and land on fine grained sand, cycle after cycle. Then one bird, one bird daring after another, ventured back into the river, beaks aligned upstream untoward estuary, Flapping, ducking, floating, unresisting, backward drawn, down to the very brink of oceanic catastrophe. Almost then, all disrupted and patterned out over the waves, all return 
again and again to land on hot, dry sand, cycle after cycle. So it was. I was convinced of their joy. Sure as anything, it was completely clear to me that they were just having fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. Um, in fact, wonderful and meaningful, right? To, to go to go to the to return to the word of the very first moment you shared with us, right? Full of meaning. Um, thank you for being our company. Thank you for letting us be become your company for this this time here. Um, thank you for taking us from prayer to song to hymn to poem, for asking what can any of us say to the inhabitants of the earth and for offering a wild iris and purple victory the nearest potential kernels of love, the ordinary consolations, the sanctuaries of eternity. Um, that was definitely, definitely blessing. So good. Um, and, and thank you also for, you know, for the acknowledgement. I, I, I hesitated as I was preparing my introduction to, you know, to kind of unnecessarily maybe acknowledge 9-11 and, and the, the, the 20th anniversary and, and the global impact that had. Um, I think if, if anything, um, just to shout out to, to what poetry can offer, you know, a day later, decades later, um, I think probably many of us continue to turn to um, Adam Zagievsky's poem, Try to Praise the Mutilated World, that kind of made the rounds very, very quickly after that event um, 20 years ago. Um, and and we just lost Adam in March of this year as well. So, you know, it's it's the poets that keep us going and the poets that remind us why we were there. So, um, all right. But speaking of poets and speaking of the world, moving on to our next reader. This is this is very exciting. Again, as as we mentioned at the beginning, the first time that um, our our next reader has been able to perform to present with us, um, even though he has been a a kind of a a returning migratory local um, for for many in many ways for many years now. Um, we are honored to to bring him into the consortium here for the first time. So, born in Swansea, Wales, Peter Thabit Jones is a Welsh poet and dramatist who has authored sixteen books, participated in festivals and conferences across America and Europe, and has won more awards in international poetry competitions than I can even begin to name. If you if you pull up his website. PeterThabitJones.com, like the, the list of accolades is almost endless. And it certainly beats doom scrolling. It's because it's glory scrolling. Um, he's been described as a master of the exact word. His poetry has been translated into 22 languages and has been featured on TV in Britain, America, Romania, Serbia. Uh, he's the founder and editor of The Seventh Cory, a highly acclaimed Welsh poetry magazine with an international perspective. And then more locally, in addition to being an annual writer in residence in Big Sur, Peters published the collection Poems from a Cabin in Big Sur and the play The Fire in the Wood based on the Big Sur sculptor Edmund Cara and which had its West Coast premiere in 2018 produced by the Unicorn Theater at the Henry Miller Library and the Carl Cherry Center for the Arts and featuring a number of people that probably everybody in the room if you're local uh, is friends with or, or has, has seen on stage at some point. Um, and if all that wasn't impressive enough, Peter's opera libretti for the Luxembourg composer Albina Petrovich Petronska, um, I apologize for, for the name, uh, mispronunciation, premiered at the Philharmonic, the National Opera House, and the National Theater of Luxembourg. So truly a, uh, a man of many talents and many, uh, many accolades. Peter, looking forward to your work today. Uh, thank you so much for your kindness. And um, it's such a pleasure to be with all of you and to be reading uh, alongside John, it really is such a pleasure. Poem for Steve, to Scott. Your new home rises out of the old fire's rage, out of the big sur mountain tops, scorched charcoal landscape, out of your heart's destruction, the devastation of blackness, after the sudden, all-consuming, ravaging flames and the loss 
of everything. With you as a mentor, Scott, your young helper, has discovered himself, masterly honed the skills for turning timber into ceiling beams, doorknobs, and perfect furniture. You have even chosen to use the damaged remains of that ferocious burning, the leftover skeletons of trees, as if saying to nature, I am one with you, and I bring you into my life, resurrected from a deadness, to these sculptural forms, to the needs for everyday living, like your dear friend, Edmund Cara, the sculptor, you are letting the wood speak to you, letting it suggest its destination towards the new shape, to its completed skin smoothness. The construction of your dwelling grows slowly, the detailed craft and labor stretching the minutes in each hour. In each hour. And as I leave your unfinished poem of a home, I, I am humbled by your devotion to your dream, to Scott's vocation, the application to a vision that unfolds in your mind. An inspiration to me, a visiting Welsh poet, a reiteration of my faith in hope, the human spirit unbending in the face of despair, and all of the windows offering the language of survival, the fine artwork of light. I, um, I once tried to make a, a dry stone wall at a, a previous place where we lived as a family. I'm a big fan of dry stone walls and it kept toppling over. And my neighbors, I could see them in the window. They were very amused. Uh, what's the crazy poet doing now? Um, but I got a poem out of it, and that's, that's all that matters to a poet. Stones. Stones take to each other naturally, like a family of sleeping creatures. The large ones accommodate little ones to create a colony of hardness. They rest in centuries of stark stillness. They are elephant heavy to lush grass. Their colors employ the afternoon sun. They are as warm as loaves from an oven. Each one embodies its personal death. They are cobbled memories of the sea. They are the solid language of labor. Each one weathered to a perfect image. They rest innocent of their history, like a gray display of featureless skulls. They have tasted our sweat and absorbed our blood. They rise and fall, symbols of man's conscience. Their persistence has sculptured their silence. They hint that their souls haunt other planets. They are magnets for our primitive thoughts. They are the armor of truth beyond us. They shape our built fears of an afterlife. They could tempt us into acts of worship. I should say before I read this next poem that uh, no creature was mistreated during the making of this poem. Uh, it's actually a metaphor for fear, the way that fear can be built up uh, until common sense goes out the window. Rat. What did we expect so close to a field? The frenzied wreck of bin bags was a clue. Frayed bursts of fist wounds in bloated polythene. Then the glimpse of brown back and fleshy tail as it slunk to its place in our bunkered wood. Rat, the rodent words scurried in our brains, filthy as road drains, sewage poured, sly, and quick as a dark glance from the corner of the eye. It swam the canal 
of my childhood fears, join those dank rats that rummaged on the banks. A cannibal that's almost 10 inches, a rat, a rat will feed on the living and the dead. It will chew the carcass of a cow, devour the frail beauty of a nest of bird's eggs. A rat will eat the shadow of itself. I look for new gaps in the outside walls, check the old shed for rat sized entrances, bolted the windows and locked all the doors. I set the bait of poison on a plate, a cereal of blue oval pellets. From behind the curtain, we watched it feed, cautiously, then greedily, out and in, out and in, like a dirty clockwork toy. Animal voyeurs, we watched it dining, shifting the small plate with a nervous tinkle. Then a loose mob of cats, our neighbor's pets, crept through our garden and lolled on the wall, aware of the creature in the stone bunker. They kept a, a still guard, a first sculpture of cats with the patience of cool, vermin killers. I put down food until it did not come, until the mound of killing pellets remained, losing their true color on a day of rain, an unwanted breakfast of oat pale seeds. We took it in turn to watch the bunker. I waited three days, then I cleared the wood, they go for the neck, I said quietly. It's dead, you assured. It's bound to be dead. I looked for a corpse like a locked dog's tail or a sloppy, ugly dart for freedom. I found no dead rat, only its leavings. You scalded the back with bleach hot water. A week gone and the rat is still with us running on the edge of our shredded lives. In the garden we watch for blurred movements. Tonight the bedroom could be the bunker, but as I undressed, the dark kept her a rat. The rat I tried to catch is in my skull, gnawing in the corners that are not clean. Its meal is my thoughts, a week's residue Caught in the warm night's enormous black trap, the rat has come through, a slit in my dream. It eats into my sleep for a last feed. It nests in a memory in my mind, discarding a mess, a plague of rat things. I should say that um, I'm a veggie who's now become a vegan. <laughs> In case you th think I caught the rat and cooked it or something. <laughs> um, I taught um, at Swansea University on the part-time degree program for 22 years, uh, retiring in 2015. And um, the majority of my students were female, uh, I would say about 90%, and they were often uh, mothers uh, returning to education, often with young children or um, uh, part-time jobs even and they were often nervous about the whole business of English literature particularly particularly poetry young woman in a classroom adult education her thoughts are like cut grass in a summer field she stares down at the poem on the page scared by its secret code. Something in her is dying or at least decaying. Married young, the children untidy, the rooms in her mind. She cannot cope, she cannot think beyond their unwritten lives. Her beautiful face is sacred, sad as Mary's, in an empty church. Her long brown hair curtains a sleepless night. 
something is gone. Something has been raped and taken away. Yet sunlight stains the window with hope. Somewhere deep in her, a wonderland girl smiles, fall like new words to an untouched page. Um, September, of course, as John mentioned, uh, September the 11th. Um, there's another date uh, etched on my mind when I think of uh, September, and uh, it's to do with my second son. This is Robert Poetry Reading, The Robert Frost Farm, USA. September grieves in me, my child lost, shines in the New Hampshire afternoon. Words leave my mouth, weighted as apples on a tree. Words farmed long ago in a room in Swansea, damp with a coffined silence. I read to people I will never reach. We are all in shadows. A poem is not a step in one's ambition. The drama of it is not an act to get somewhere. I am a singer merely. I sing my song. Something there is in me that loves a war, the separation from others. No more heroes, no more dreams. Life's what it is, not what it seems. I wrote long ago when the stars fell down. And our their child lost, Robert's and Eleanor's, shines in my mind. The folding of the clothes no longer needed. The falling emptiness, the why crying through the soul's universe. The scream of the blood that the staring eyes shed. Grief of visitor in the rooms of the head. Something that is in me that loves a war, the separation. My words, their words, fall like apples when there is no one around. And the air, natural as God, consumes the song. So I will go back to Big Sur. Uh, I'm blessed to be able to uh, spend so much time with friends, uh, Patricia, Bill, John, Lisa, and many, many more uh, when I stop in the cabin uh, in Big Sur. And I seem to have the wrong book, uh, just a moment. Full Moon, Big Sur, California. I light up the white flowers, torches that now worship the seeds in my sky. I dazzle the limp pool with the eve-shaped woman as pale as my smile swims in my dream. I polish the trunks of the trees with their growing thoughts of my silver blood. I manifest my eternity in the goddess eyes of a statued cat. I startle the strange, gripped land with my tiring milk of coldness. I claim the night's far borders with the diamond thirst of my depths. I drug the renegade moments with the ancient spell of my silence. And I make the metallic muscles of the ocean, flexing their flow of energy, carry the cargoes of my tambourine soul. And I'll 
finish with uh, a poem. I think it's self-explanatory. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of poets who, um, who feel like this sometimes that uh, maybe you weren't a poet and that words weren't bothering you all the time. Um, but this one uh, is called The Green Bird. The Green Bird for Vince and Annie Clemente. You were born glowing, and when the green bird landed on you, it left all its songs. But you preferred silence, the raindrop of a thought shining on a leaf, a shadow statued in prayer. The crowds waited like a river. The poetry of your soul would silver the desert, the eons of poverty. You sent them a stone, they built you a tomb. You pointed to the moon, they broke all their mirrors. Words shone like stars in your mind, they were not to be sung. Silence surrounded you like the perfume of flowers. You breathed in the universe as you shared each moment, as stiff as a snake that's mesmerized by light. On the edge of morning, they found you perfected. You'd made it to God. They cut down a tree. You died in the darkness, but glowing inside. The bright songs of the green bird had flown from your mouth. Thank you so much, thank you. Wow. Uh, oh my goodness. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, John. Thank you both for, for what a, what a grace, gracious, grace-filled blessing. Thank you, Peter, for letting us be one with you, for letting us be brought into your life, for bringing your life into ours. Yeah. Um, you had a line, the, the unfinished poem of a home. I feel like we, we've got to build unfinished homes out of these poems that we've lived into and ventured through and continue yeah. to dwell in as we go through our, our afternoons and evenings and nights and mornings moving forward here. Um, mm, so much, so much power, so much depth. Um, <laughs> and I wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought of, uh, of another, another uh, kind of British Isle shout out, but the, the rat, the rat nibbling on his own shadow. Um, I, I, a couple of years ago, well, many, many years ago now in, in Boston, I got to hear um, the Scottish poet, Don Patterson, read his poem about a rat, kind of a, a thought rat um, mm. and, and Ted Hughes thought fox and all of, all of those great British thought animals. <laughs> mm. um, that was, that was lots of fun to, to hear the, uh, the scampering echoes. Um, and then especially to go from a Welsh dry stone wall to the Tor House in Carmel and and to Frost, you know, kind of halfway, halfway between the two. Um, and something there is that may or may not love walls and fences, but uh, green birds and goldfinches make good neighbors. So at least, at least there's that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry, terrible, terrible pun. Frost would never forgive me, but um, Anyway, again, thank you, thank you both. Thank you, um, so much. Thank you. definitely. Um, I would like to um, to again shout out as I, as I mentioned at the beginning here to a couple couple more upcoming events, couple more opportunities for us all to uh, to continue to celebrate and enrich our lives with poetry as we move forward. Um, please, everybody. Join us back here, here on Zoom, here in this consortium community, Sunday, October 10th, next month, same time, 2 p.m. Pacific Standard, and uh, for a reading with Catherine Petrocelli and Paola Bruni. I'm um, going to be just a wonderful, another wonderful moment uh, to, to soak up good poems. Um, also, before that, um, on October 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, it's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and I'll, I'll put this in the chat here. Um, Old Capital Books, our, our brick and mortar sponsors and hosts in, in regular years are sponsoring the second Monterey Poetry Festival. Uh, we, they're not calling it annual because it's, it's kind of 
skips a few years in between, but um, there is there is the link for that if anyone is interested. Um, again, there's multiple events, multiple sessions spread out over three days. Some of them will be live in person. Many, I think all of them will be in person. Some of them will also be available over Zoom uh, to stream if you're further afield. Um, also, just again, as a shout out, um, the Monterey Poetry, Re Poetry Review has its newest issue out. Uh, just came out last week. I put that in the link here as well, or that in the chat. Um, it's co-edited, co-created by one of our consortium collaborators, Jen Legere Felgeth. Um, so check check that out for all of our wonderful local poets. And then um, last last but not least, um, I was asked to shout out to the Chaparral Poets Youth Virtual Conference is going to be coming up on Wednesdays, three months in a row, October 13th, November 10th, and December 8th from 4 to 5 p.m. digitally via Zoom, um, featuring speakers, conference, constant speakers and poets, um, Grace Losher, Sharon Smith, and Indigo Moore. Um, I don't have a link for that, but if you're interested, um, just let me know and I will be glad to um, forward an email to you or reach, reach out to me, reach out to Bob or Jennifer or John, um, and we'll get you connected to that. And, um, and then again, if you're not already following the consortium on Facebook, please feel free to, to befriend us there on, on the social media platform of our, of our most, most popular choice. Um, just ask to be friends. We will definitely bring you in. Um, Jen, Jennifer Legere will bring you in and we will keep you on the, on the list for all the upcoming events. So again, thank you everybody so much for the, for the beauty of this afternoon. Thank you, John and Peter. Thank you all, all global citizens for tuning in. And uh, again, stay, stay and linger as you would like, chat with the folks as you want, or have a, a wonderful rest of your day otherwise. Thank you so much for um, looking after the, after the evening. Thank you so much. Yes. Absolutely. It's actually 10 past 11, you past my bedtime. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you for the late night reading. Oh my goodness. <laughs> It's past Caroline's bedtime too. I, I of course, yes, yes, Caroline. Yes, and we've got some East Coast folks who uh, can't don't have bedtime problems, but are probably ready for dinner. I Indeed, see. yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Hey, thank you, John and Peter. Great reading. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you, again, Peter. Thank, you. thank you, Peter. Thank you, John. Thank you, thank you Patricia. <laughs> so, yeah. is, is, the weather's nice there. Gorgeous. Can't you see out the window? <laughs> yeah, we're waiting, Peter. We're waiting for your arrival. You can see it. Yeah, that's what I said. You can get out the window, Peter. We won't take up any more time. <laughs> no, it's lovely to see everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great. It's the same sun that's shining here, Peter, that will be shining for you when you get up in the morning. With a bit of luck. <laughs> we'll keep it warm for you. This is Swansea, you know, we, we wet and damp and damp and wet. Dingy rain, Dylan Thomas described it as. Dingy rain. That's good. Okay, well, I love you and leave all of you, if you don't mind. Yeah. Thank uh, you it's again. It's been such a pleasure and many, many thanks for the invitation. Many, many thanks. Truly, truly honored to be with you. Take care. Good to see you, Peter. Yeah. Thank well, you. Peter. Bye, Lisa. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Sweet dreams. Bye -bye. Peace be with everybody. Peace be with you all. <laughs>